Hello. Hi. Welcome to night school. I'm Aria. And I'm Christina. And um, we are streaming to you uh, from our homes, but on behalf of the California Academy of Sciences and Nightlife, which is our uh, weekly Thursday event that brings science, art, culture um, to the Academy floor. And we're doing some of that here online. <laughs> um, and today on night school, we are kind of going hand in hand with the on the floor programming that's happening, which is featuring astronomy and cultural astronomy and all of the different ways that that takes shape. So today we're hearing from a lineup of folks who are also telling stories about different aspects of space down here on earth um, in a whole different you know, multitude of ways. And I will let Christina go ahead and introduce them. Thank you, Aria. And hi, nightlifers, if you see us on the floor. <laughs> um, anyway, so first up, we have writer Jamie Green. Uh, she's the series editor for Best American Science and Nature Writing. And she's going to share a talk about her upcoming book. So you're getting a little sneak peek about the ways we talk about life in science and science fiction. And then we have Briley Lewis, who's a National Science Foundation fellow and PhD candidate at UCLA, who is very interested in the life story of exoplanets and telling their story widely. She'll share what imaging and observing exoplanets can tell us about how they form and evolve. And finally, artist Shahira Stargazer will share about how she uses her art to advocate for and educate about light pollution in more creative, relatable ways. So yeah, great lineup. Yeah, and as always, we have a live program happening tonight. So say hi, let us know where you're watching from. Um, let us know if it's your first time joining us or if you're a regular. Um, sorry to people in the night school or nightlife floor who can't type hello, but we see you. We love you. Um, <laughs> and stay tuned for uh, Q and A's after everyone's presentation. So get your questions in. All right, and, and um, here's Jamie. Yeah. Hello. All right. Um, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you all for having me and for watching. Um, I'm Jamie Green. I'm a writer and I'm going to be sharing you a little bit from the book that I've been working on for the last three years. It's called The Possibility of Life. It's about how we imagine extraterrestrial life in science and in science fiction and what we can learn from putting all of those imaginings together, both about what might be out there and about how we understand life on Earth. And so um, today I'm going to be talking about some of the research and ideas from that book, specifically about how we imagine planets and what science and science fiction do when we put them together, because they have a very long history, as we'll see, of being completely intertwined. So here we go. That didn't work. Let's try that again. Now here we go. <laughs> so humans have wondered about what beings there might be other than humans for as long as we've been human, you know, before recorded history, whether that's in terms of gods and angels or ghosts and spirits. We're always looking for different ways to make sense of ourselves in context of something bigger. Um, but for millennia, in Western culture at least, we couldn't imagine life on other worlds because we didn't have a way of imagining other worlds. Those just didn't exist in our worldview at all. And that's because the way that most people understood the cosmos was this way, with the earth at the center of the solar system, of the universe, of everything, surrounded by the sun, the moon, the planets beyond them, the sphere of the stars, all orbiting us. And the earth was the only world. And if you can't imagine other worlds, you can't even start to think about who might be on other worlds. And of course, even in the West, even in ancient Greece, there were challenges to this. There were other worldviews. But for thousands of years, this was dominant thanks to Aristotle. He was the one who really established the geocentric worldview as the thing. And for him, it was mostly philosophical. Of course, it like matches what you see when you look out at the sky. You know, the stars move, the sun moves. It seems like everything is moving around the earth. For Aristotle, this was also philosophical. It also had to do with how he thought physics worked. The model wasn't a great match, though. 
And so for thousands of years, people tried to tweak it and make it work. But philosophically, it was just really successful. Um, the Catholic Church loved the geocentric model because humans on Earth central to God's creation makes a lot of sense. So it wasn't until the European Renaissance when two guys came along and finally broke through Aristotle's uh, hold on things. And they would be Copernicus and Galileo. Copernicus was first, and he approached changing the model mathematically. He wasn't trying to overthrow the geocentric model. He was trying to fix it because in the years since Aristotle, the many, many years, the model had gotten really messy because it didn't work. It didn't predict when planets would appear in the sky or where, and it had gotten really complicated to try to um, account for all the flaws. For example, the idea of epicycle. So it wasn't that planets orbited the Earth. It was that the planets orbited a little point that was on an orbit going around the Earth. A mess. What Copernicus discovered when he set out to fix the model was that he had to totally scrap it and that things worked a lot better with the solar system that we know now with the sun at the center and the Earth orbiting as well as the planet. So this was the first step towards seeing the Earth as a world like the other planets, just another planet. The second important step came from Galileo, and he added observation to this mathematical model because with his improvements in telescopes, he was able to see the planets as worlds for the first time. You know, they were called planets, but when you see them with your naked eye or a weak telescope, they just look like points of light, just like the stars. They move differently. But it wasn't until Galileo that, you know, he saw Saturn's rings. And at the bottom here, most importantly, he saw the phases of Venus. And that was how he discovered that the planets were actually spheres, just like the Earth. And this changed everything. This meant that the Earth wasn't the only world. There were other worlds. And now we had places to imagine other beings being. The first world that scientists and writers and thinkers who were often all the same person doing all of those jobs, the first one that they started really imagining life on was the moon. In 1634, Johannes Kepler, another very important astronomer in the history of our understanding the geometry of the solar system, he was the one who figured out that orbits aren't perfect circles, which even Copernicus was still really attached to, but that they're ellipses. Um, he wrote a work called Somnium, which is sometimes credited as the first work of science fiction in which the narrator dreams that he is reading a book and in the book, a spirit from the moon comes and talks about what's on the moon. And what's on the moon is life, just like life on earth. The idea was that once we realized that the planets were made of the same sort of stuff as the earth, the same material, it was just a natural leap by analogy that like, okay, if there's a world there, just like on Earth, it would have life just like on Earth. And so the, the spirit insomnium describes all sorts of flora and fauna and people. And he also goes into a lot of detail about the differences of the moon society on the side that faces the Earth and the side that never sees the Earth. Because part of what this early science fiction was doing and what a lot of even contemporary science fiction does is using imagination to try to make sense of new scientific discoveries, to try to say, okay, we're saying the moon is the world, is a world. What happens if I imagine a society on there? It gives us a way to transport ourselves as, you know, like this disembodied spirit onto the surface of the moon and make sense of it through experience. Um, about a decade later, Francis Godwin, an English bishop, wrote The Man in the Moon about, as you can see, a man who is brought to the moon by a flock of geese. Um, and he also, you know, discovers there, or yeah, discovers there that it's like a supersized version of Earth because through these early telescopes, it looked like uh, the moon's mountains were much bigger than the Earth's. So then by analogy, okay, bigger mountains, more exaggerated landscape, more exaggerated sizes. And from there, people started populating the entire solar system. Um, around the turn of the 19th century, one astronomer speculated that sunspots were actually little holes in the sun's very hot surface, revealing a cool, 
dark world underneath, which of course was populated. Um, in the 1830s, an amateur astronomer decided or suggested that Saturn's rings should be home to about 8 million beings. This was a time of abundance. The more we learned through science about astronomy, that was just more places to put life. You know, okay, the planets are worlds, put life on them. And the more we learned, the more we learned, it was just life everywhere. And for a while, you know, from Copernicus and Galileo, science was opening up the possibilities for places for life to be. But, you know, probably enough about astronomy to know that that trend did not continue, that eventually the possibilities started being closed and shut down and reduced. It starts with the moon. The first telescopes looking at the moon say, oh, look, mountains, valleys, let's put some people on there. There must be people on there. We get better telescopes, we're like, all right, that does not look like such a friendly place to live. I don't see any cities, I don't see any forests, that's fine, the moon is barren. I'll imagine people on Mars and Venus. Um, you know, Venus is covered in clouds. I'm sure there's a steamy jungle under there. Then we get some better technology, some better um, observations. All right, maybe that is not a, a steamy jungle. Maybe it's hundreds and hundreds of degrees and so hot that even a space probe when it lands can only last for like 20 minutes. Okay, maybe Mars. Okay, there are no forests on Mars. There are no cities on Mars. Maybe there are microbes on Mars. And then we send some landers there and we're still looking. Okay, there goes the solar system. But then there's the question of planets beyond the solar system, exoplanets. And this is also a way where our imagination expands or contracts with what science tells us is possible. Um, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, it was thought that planet formation was a fluke. So maybe we were really alone. Then in the second half of the 20th century, the going theory was that planet formation was just a sort of natural consequence of star formation. And a beautiful, elegant theory was devised based on the architecture of our solar system, you know, rocky planets on the inside, big gas giants and ice giants on the outside. Wonderful. We knew what to look for. But it wasn't until 1995, which is mind-blowingly recent, that the first exoplanet around a sun-like star was found, 1995. And that was the first time that we actually knew that our solar system was not one in a galaxy, that there were other planets around other stars. And that planet was 51 Pegasi b, illustrated here. But there was a problem. It created some problems for the way we had been imagining other solar systems were going to look. So you can see here on this diagram up at the top, um, this shows the, the dots are not to scale, but this shows the orbital distances, the distances that all the planets are from the sun. You know, Mercury is very close, very hot. Earth is farther out, it's nice and comfy out here. This is where 51 Peg B orbits. Real, real, really close to its star. But this is not some like hot, rocky Mercury. You can see down here, it's a gas giant. It's a little bit bigger than Jupiter. This wasn't a problem for the habitability of this one planet, but it was a problem for our understanding of planet formation because the way we understood it and the way we understand it now, a gas giant can't form that close to its star. And we didn't know what it was doing there. And so scientists had to change and adapt their models. And this really threw into question whether um, the sort of layout of our solar system was going to be common or rare. But the only way to figure that out is to find more planets. And luckily for us, we did. We have found a lot of them. Um, last I checked, which was like a week ago, so this may have changed, we we're at 5,014 exoplanets confirmed outside of our solar system. And one of the most amazing things about this, other than their abundance, is their diversity. Um, you have planets like 51 Peg B that are called hot Jupiters, big gas giants orbiting super close to their stars. Um, you have uh, a kind of planet called a super Earth or a mini Neptune, which is, you know, in the size range between Earth and Neptune, which seems like it might be the most common kind of planet out there, which we have none of in our solar system. So Copernicus, hundreds of years ago, showed the Earth is not special. The Earth is not 
the only planet. The Earth is not the center of the solar system or the universe or anything. But now we have to wonder, is Earth unique? Is Earth rare? What kind of life might be on other planets? And so this diversity of planets gives contemporary scientists, science fiction writers, all of us, lots of planets to think about and lots of different kinds of planets to imagine life on. So I'm going to wrap up by talking about two of my favorites. Um, these are from Stephen Baxter's book, Landfall, which is a collection of novellas set in his, in the universe of, as you can see, the Flood Ark universe. Flood and Ark are a duology of books where, um, a crew of humans leave Earth and they disembark at two different planets, which they very creatively call Earth 2 and Earth 3. And Earth 2 and Earth 3 um, end up being sort of like thought experiments for imagining what would it be like to live on a planet very different from Earth. So um, for Earth 2, the question is basically, what would it be like to have very different seasons? So here on Earth, the seasons exist because the axis of our planet is slightly tilted. Um, so you can see here in summer, the northern hemisphere is tilted toward the sun. The sun's rays are more direct. It gets hotter. In winter, we're tilted away from the sun. The sun's rays come in at a more oblique angle, less direct on you. It's cooler. How would you make a planet with really extreme seasons. Well, it turns out we have an example of that in our solar system. It's Uranus, which orbits practically totally on its side. One scientist once described it to me as like a rotisserie chicken. So this is how you get really, really extreme swings in season. So looking at the North Pole over here, this is winter. And rather than just being tilted away a little, it's pointing entirely away from the sun. So the entire hemisphere has days and days and months of perpetual darkness. And then in summer, you're pointing straight at the sun. So that means that from going from winter to summer, every spot on the globe at some point gets direct beating straight overhead sunlight, which on earth only a band around the tropics gets. And so um, Bacter has his humans making sense of this with six different seasons. So just looking at spring, Spring starts out kind of cold, but then the sun is directly overhead and it gets hot. And then even into summer, the days get longer, but it cools off. And it's these rapid swings of temperature. And he imagines that the humans living on this planet find this really disconcerting, that the seasons change so quickly, especially in spring and fall, catches them by surprise. And they're trying to make sense of this through their ancestry on Earth. But, you know, they reflect that even on Earth, the change of seasons feels kind of weird because deep in our evolutionary past, they say we're used to the tropics. The other example, Earth 3, says, what if we orbited a different kind of star? So, you know, there are stars that are hotter than the sun, cooler than the sun. And for the purposes of life on that planet, one of the big questions is where is the habitable zone? You know, where can you be, how far from the star can you be to have liquid water on your surface as just a basic prerequisite for life? And so Earth 3 is around a cooler star than the sun. It's a red dwarf star, which is actually the most common kind of star in the galaxy. So the habitable zone of a red dwarf is really close in. And what this means for a planet is that the gravitational influence of the star um, affects the planet's orbit so that they become tidally locked. Just like the moon is to Earth, one hemisphere is always facing the star. It's a little bit like this. For a planet, that means that one side is just baking, baking, baking. The other side is totally frozen. And in this imagining of it, only the edge, the sort of perpetual dusk, is habitable. For Baxter, he's imagining that, and this is plausible, that the atmosphere and weather could sort of redistribute the heat so that um, it's not so that you can sort of live on the whole planet. But something that's really cool about this is instead of horizontal bands of uh, climate, like we have on Earth going up and down from the equator, the climate zones look like a bullseye, which I think is just interesting, thinking about the different ways that that would affect um, you know, agriculture and culture and all of that. And Baxter goes into that. I think these books are really great, by the way, not just as scientific examples, but they're fun to read. Um, and you also have the experience of the sun just hanging in the sky, not moving ever. 
it's either always day or always night. Nothing ever changes. No seasons, no movement, no nothing. And again, Baxter imagines this as weird for his human colonists and like challenging for life on the planet. And it, so if we step back and look at these examples, and there are lots of other examples in sci-fi, we often end up seeing the earth as like supremely peak most comfortable, most habitable possible planet we can imagine. We see lush jungles. We see life filling every niche. And so then the question is, is this where Copernicus's lesson ends? Is this where Earth really is special, really the most comfortable, habitable planet? Um, or do we just need to go back to the drawing board and really stretch our imaginations? What kinds of planets, what kinds of worlds, and what kinds of life can we imagine? And that is my whole talk. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Jamie. Hello. Um, this was great. I'm here for some for some rapid Q and A, but right. I'm never gonna forget Rotisserie Chicken Planet. Um, <laughs> like that goes that goes to Lindy Elkins Tanton. Um, she told me that, and I was like, "Yep, that is perfect. It's delicious. <laughs> it's very excellent." Yeah. Um. So, okay, first, uh, could you tell us a little bit more about what kinds of changes have maybe been made to how we think about planet formation generally? Like, um, yes. yeah, just more I about that. I have a feeling Riley is more of an expert on this than I am. Um, but it's basically that we've had to account for a lot of migration, that um, planets don't just form in place as they're spinning, you know, and there's more material farther out where there's a lot of frozen material. And so that's why you get gas giants and ice giants. But closer to the sun, um, the ice stuff is gas. And so you just are working with rock. And that very nicely explains why the little rocky planets are closer in and the big gaseous planets are farther out. But we've found enough examples of uh, different configurations that there doesn't, as far as I know, and again, I am a writer who's done a lot of research, but not a scientist, there isn't enough material for a Jupiter-sized planet to form close to its star. So um, it seems like planet formation is much more chaotic than was originally thought, which again is a very similar process of discovery to, you know, in the Renaissance, okay, we've got these perfect spheres. Oh, they can't be perfect. They have to be ellipses, you know, like the elegant models sometimes are a little too clean and perfect and nature's a little, little messier. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Um, and then, okay. So, so moving on to my next question, um, yeah. outside of just like, you know, rotations and orbits, like you've mentioned, um, are there any other particularly fascinating ways that authors have imagined exoplanets that come to mind? Um, I mean, one of there, there are a lot, one of my, I'll, I'll give two favorites. Um, one is in the fifth season by N.K. Jemisin, which is like more of a fantasy novel than sci-fi. Um, but the role of the moon is really important. In and, and scientifically, we think the moon might be really important for habitability on Earth. It stabilizes our orbit. Its creation may have been what allows Earth to have plate tectonics. Tides seem to have been very important for evolution for life to move on to land. Um, and so they're just really fun resonances in that fantasy world. There's also a book I read while I was researching my book called A Darkling Sea, which is set on an alien planet um, that like some of the moons in the outer solar system is completely covered with ice and has a sort of subsurface ocean that has no light because it's under you know miles of ice. And so imagining how intelligent life would have evolved there is is just really interesting and is a very cool example of that. Yeah, no, absolutely. And then along those lines, my uh, my final question that uh, I would love to hear about is: yeah. Do you have any other sci-fi recommendations or like quintessential reading? In, oh gosh, in this I'm like area? looking at my shelf. Um, I, I mean, God, there are so many. Um, I think a really fascinating one and just a wonderful book is Semiosis by Sue Burke, which um, I don't want to give it away, but it's a really interesting look at how intelligence might evolve on another planet. Um, cool. So I would say that. And um, Dawn by Octavia Butler 
Everyone talks yep. about Parable of the Sower, but I think Dawn is just like a masterpiece and is such a fascinating way of looking at how an alien who we have so much in common with could still be like so alien to us. Yeah, oh, I, I love those Ricks. Um, and then, sorry, I lied. One more question. When does your book yeah. come out? <laughs> when can we get I it? I like that question a lot. <laughs> it is a tricky answer though, because my book comes out in April of 2023, okay, which is cool. a very long time from now. <laughs> Or mark um, your calendars. Everybody yeah, get it mark down. your calendars. <laughs> I don't know, like follow me on Twitter. I promise I will be talking about it nonstop for the next year, but also talk about other things so it won't be too painful. Absolutely. No, no. This sounds <laughs> this sounds great. Book talk is never okay. painful. Okay. But um <laughs> thank you so much, Jamie. This was thank wonderful. Thank you. This was really and fun. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, a pleasure. And All we right. are gonna go ahead and bring up Briley next. All right. So. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Briley Lewis, and I'm a PhD student in astronomy and astrophysics at UCLA. Um, and Aria, can you share my slides? Sweet. Thank you. Um, so tonight, I'm going to be telling you about the story of how planets form. And I really mean it is a story. So you might think at <laughs> the beginning, you might get a little lost, but it'll come back, I promise. Um, so I first want you to imagine a field of flowers. So you've scattered these seeds all throughout the year. So they're all at different points in their growth. But the thing is, you don't have time to sit in this flower field and wait for one flower to grow. You just have this one moment in time. So how can you figure out how a flower grows and develops? Um, I'll give you guys a minute to think about that. If you have thoughts, you can put them in the chat. So how does a flower grow and develop? How can we figure that out from a snapshot in time of this flower field? Okay, so hopefully you've had a second to think. So what we can do with this is in that one snapshot view, since you've got these different flowers that are at different points in their development. Oh yeah, I see someone in the chat put observe some at each stage. Well done. So in this view, we've got those different flowers at different points in their development. And so you can use individual flowers as snapshots into a moment in time of how flowers, generally speaking, grow. And you can use those individual snapshots and sort of arrange them and use that information to make a timeline of what one of these flowers looks like from beginning to end. And so we actually do something really similar to figure out how planets form. So in instead of a field of flowers, we have a sky full of stars, all in different stages of how they're forming planets around them. And of course we can't wait for a planet to grow because unlike a flower, planets take millions and millions of years to form. So we just don't have that time to wait around. So we're looking at all these different snapshots of planetary systems in different stages of their evolution. And the real thing looks a little bit something like this. So all of these, except the solar system cartoon, are real shots of nebulae, protoplanetary disks, and planets around other stars. So we know that planets start form from a cloud of gas around a star known as a protoplanetary disk. So this is my little cartoon. I realize that it looks a little bit like an egg, but it's supposed to be a cloud of gas with a star in the center. So all of this leftover gas and dust that's in this disk didn't end up making it into the star itself. And that's what's going to go on to form planets around this star. And we have fantastic images of this part of the process from radio telescopes like ALMA, the Atacama Large Millimeter Array in Chile. So each of these points on the on the left hand side, each of these little rings situations are all actually different planet forming disks around different stars. And this is in their earlier stages when they're still mostly made of gas. And then we know that the end point for planet formation is something like our own solar system. So we're very familiar with what, you know, the end goal here looks like. We have really great 
you know, detailed information from both observations from Earth of other planets in our solar system and the various NASA missions that have visited each planet. So we're really familiar with what our solar system at its point in evolution looks like. So we start with a big blob of gas around a star and then somehow end up with planets neatly organized and with all this space in between them. So what happens in the middle? And that's where the research that I work on comes in. So one of the things that happens in the middle is known as a debris disk. So what happens is you start with that protoplanetary disk, this big disk of gas and dust. And some of that gas gets pushed out by winds from the star, and some of it ends up getting gathered up into planets. After enough time, about two to 10 million years, then gaps in the disk start to appear as that gas is lost. So a lot of the pictures we see of protoplanetary disks, there are gaps that have actually been carved by planets sucking up all the gas around them. And so then finally, once you get rid of most of the gas, you end up with something called a debris disk. And this is a disk of dust and rock that's still hanging around the star. And these stages, again, to connect to real images might look something like this. These are all real images. Um, and a debris disk is much closer to what a planetary system like ours looks like now. Not quite, it's still a little younger, but we do actually still have some debris lingering around in our solar system. Um, we have the asteroid belt that's between Mars and Jupiter, and we have the Kuiper belt beyond Neptune where Pluto is. And so for my own research, I've been looking into individual debris disks whose pictures have been taken by an instrument called the Gemini Planet Imager, which is on a telescope in Chile. So by understanding in detail what's going on in on one of these disks, then we can get a better idea of how the whole timeline of planet formation is laid out. So again, all of these pictures on the left here, each little square is a different disk around a different star. So really by understanding one of the disks, one of the flowers, we can get more information about the process as a whole. So it's like having really good detailed information on one of those flowers in the field. You know more about its color. You know more about what it's made of. You know more about the details of what it looks like. So you ask yourself things like, what can I figure out about why this is the way that it is? What has changed from the earlier stages? Um, is it made of different things than before? Like has its composition changed? Does it look different? Like is the structure different? And from that, we can try to figure out how planet formation works. But there is one complication here too, which is that not all of these stories are exactly the same. So say some of the flowers in our field are these pink flowers, whereas others are these different kind of red flower. And although there's a lot of similarities in how they grow, the details might be different, like exactly how fast they go. Um, what parts they have, like what their structure is, um, and most importantly, what they end up looking like at the end of their growth process. So planetary systems are similar. Not every one looks like our solar system. In fact, there's a ton of variety. Like Jamie mentioned, we've found things that we totally didn't expect and that show that, you know, maybe different things happened in a different, you know, in a different system than ours. Um, like Jamie mentioned how there are hot Jupiters, you know, these very close in Jupiter-like planets um, around other stars, and we just don't have one of those. So something different must have happened there. There is one more middle step in this story, which is that with the same technology we use to take those pictures of debris disks, we can also take images of young planets. So planets that are still warm from all the heat that they had as they formed. So this is a real movie of the real orbits of four real planets um, all around a star called HR 8799, a little bit over a hundred light years away. So each of these dots you can see moving around is orbiting the star that's been blocked out in the center. Each of them is much bigger than Jupiter and way further out too. So the inner one is about double the distance of Jupiter. Then there's double the distance of Saturn, Uranus and Neptune and so on. So it's like a scaled up outer solar system. And so these are unlike anything we have in our own solar system. So we know there's multiple different paths, multiple different stories that planet formation can manifest as. And to make it clear, taking a picture like that is not easy. Imaging exoplanets and debris disks is a really difficult endeavor. So we still only have so much detail we can see. Trying to take a picture of an exoplanet 
is kind of like trying to see a firefly that's buzzing around the bright lights of Las Vegas from all the way here in Los Angeles. So there's a lot we have to do to make this work. We use a specialized part called a coronagraph to block out those big Las Vegas lights, um, which is you know the star that the planet or disk is around. And we have to make sure we're taking crisp, clear images on a nice large telescope to get as much detail as possible. Because the bigger the light bucket, the more light you collect, the more detail you can see. So this is comparing you know, what just a normal handheld camera can do to look at the night sky versus what Hubble can do. Um, and so I could give a whole other talk on this because imaging planets is a really complicated business. But the cool thing is we can do it and our technology is always getting better. So we're seeing more and more of these details of how planets form all the time. It's like going from seeing one of those flowers in the field from really far away to being able to study it a little up close. Um, so you get more and more information, the more detail you get. So to come back to our story then, we filled in the middle with debris disks and young planets both of which we can take photos of with the specialized tech that I mentioned. Of course, this is a really simplified, really general picture. There's a lot of other stuff that happens, including planets migrating around like Jamie mentioned. Um, but broadly speaking, we go from this big clump of gas to a disk of gas, to a disk of dust, to a nice planetary system. That's the overarching story we've got here. And we're learning more about it all the time with these different snapshots. And so stories like this are really common in science. In fact, they are science. So we want to figure out in science how things work. We want to know the beginning, the middle and end, all of the steps, how all the steps connect and you know what causes what. That's really what the process of science is. And so I've been spending a lot of time recently working on incorporating writing into college science courses both for future scientists and STEM majors and for folks taking introductory STEM courses. So for science majors, they need to know how to write so that they can communicate the things that they're working on, um, you know, as they go further into their careers in science. Um, scientists need to be able to understand each other for, in order for the collaborative aspect of science to keep going. Um, and scientists need to be able to communicate their results to people who aren't in science. Um, a lot of us are paid by taxes. We have a responsibility to share what we've learned. Um, and then for folks who are taking these introductory STEM courses, you might think, why do they need to learn to write about science? That's not their expertise. But having the ability to actually engage with science, to engage with these stories, can make everyone feel more comfortable understanding and engaging with science in general. So I wanna teach everyone how to tell the stories of the universe and how to engage with the stories of science. We all really do need to get familiar with these stories so that we can, you know, understand what's going on in the news and make the world a better place overall. So if any of my students did tune in tonight, I invited them. Um, this message will be familiar to them. Um, I've been telling them all quarter. I know you guys think that this is overwhelming, but you can do it. Like really, anyone can do this. So although science often seems complicated and obscure, and you know, something that only a select few people can do. Really, anyone can learn about science. Um, anyone can work hard to learn about science. And don't get me wrong, you definitely do need expertise to really like dig into it, do the cutting edge research, and experts are doing incredible things and have lots of important knowledge. But anyone can learn the fundamental concepts, anyone can learn the stories. So science communication is all about translating the technical language of experts into a story that anyone can enjoy. And I really, really do mean it when I say anyone can learn the stories of the universe. And similarly, anyone can learn to tell them too. So thank you all so much for your time. Um, and I hope that was fun. I would love to hear your questions. Hey, Briley, thanks so much. Um, also, is that your cute pup? puppy there that is my cute pup yes i saw i saw, I saw <laughs> a cute pup kind of like blurry in the background there and, is in fact and, a I yeah. always on the side there's a cute little blur way down there well, yeah yeah mm -hmm. um well thank you so much that was fascinating and um and so the first question is somebody wants to know how likely or how unlikely is it for stars to not form planets during their development? Like how often does it become mm. a planet? How often does it not? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, people are really working on understanding right now how many planets are out there. 
So mm -hmm. with missions like the Kepler Space Telescope, which have found planets in a different way than what I described, they're looking yeah. at stars and inferring there's a planet around. But with missions like Kepler, we found a ton of planets. I think the count is like 5,000 nowadays. Um, yeah. And so people are looking at, okay, now that we have this big sample of planets, how many planets on average were around each star? How many planets of each size are there? And right now it seems like the consensus is every star has about one planet. So there might be some that don't, and there might be some have, that have multiple, but planets are really common. Um, mm. So yeah. That's <laughs> so funny, I've never heard that likely. before. Planets, super common. Yeah, um, wildly <laughs> common. We we find we keep finding them. We just keep finding more and more of them. <laughs> yeah. Is there a reason that a star would be oh, responsible for like more planets, like more of a system or versus stars that are just like have rogue kind of planets? Yeah, that's a great question. So I personally don't know yet. And I don't know if we really totally have a good answer for that, like as a field yet. Mm -hmm. Um since so far, we haven't found a ton of multi-planet systems. Like we've definitely found a good handful, but um, I think we're going to need to keep finding planets. And so right now, um, pretty much a couple years ago in like the beginnings of exoplanet science, we were like, okay, let's find any planets we can with whatever technique we can. Mm -hmm. And each technique for finding planets is a little bit biased towards one kind of planet. And so it's like, if you looked at one star with one method and not any of the other methods, you'd only find a certain kind of planet. And so now what people are doing is they're combining these techniques. So they're saying, okay, we found a small close in planet with this one method. Let's go look for a like bigger Jupiter like planet right. um, further away with another method. And so now we're starting to get a more complete picture of these systems of like, okay, do they have small rocky planets and gas mm -hmm. giants like ours? Mm -hmm. And all of that is research that's still very much underway. I know there's people at UCLA working on it um, and elsewhere too. Cool. Um, and then, Oh, so this is great. Somebody asks, can amateur astronomers help in an effort to understand planet formation? Yes, um, there's actually lots of ways for you to do that. Um, one of the best is um, a citizen science effort called Zooniverse. Um, so if you just Google Zooniverse, like the word zoo and then the rest of universe except the U. Um, there's a bunch of astronomy citizen science projects where astronomers who have these really big data sets that can only be classified by eye, uh, they put them up there, give people instructions on how to you know, look at these kinds of images, and then people can help classify these images. And one of them is about uh, planet forming disks. So cool. definitely lots of ways to get involved. Oh, that's great. Um, and then, do you know, Aaron asks, how soon after the Big Bang did the first star systems evolve? Oh, I don't know the number. Um, I admittedly only ever think about the last, you know, a couple million years of, <laughs> <laughs> of things. I don't think that far, far back, back usually. Um, yeah, sure. It took a while. Yeah. <laughs> I'm yeah. not sure the actual number, um, but yeah. it took a while because, um, you know, galaxies had to form um, and then we started getting conditions that were more right for planets to be able to form. Mm -hmm. um, and we wouldn't have gotten anything like Earth until fairly further on because we needed time for the uh, universe to actually make all of the heavier elements that are present in things like like the Earth. Yeah. Um, and also, can you tell us about some of your cool zine projects or other um, SciComm projects you've you've seen or done that you've really liked? Yeah, totally. Um, there's a lot of really cool SciComm that people are doing on TikTok that I mm. I love. I, I admittedly have been, I downloaded TikTok in March, 2020 and I'm stuck ah, now. Yes. Um, and so there's a lot of really cool scientists who are doing stuff on there. Um, I do love zines, you mentioned zines. Mm -hmm. um, I actually had a wonderful workshop with my students, my uh, first year undergrads at UCLA this morning, where mm -hmm. I had them make a zine about something that they've learned in our class so far. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so we spent like an hour cool. doing the arts and crafts. Um, and so zines are these little, you know, like self-published magazine booklets um, that have been used for really a lot of stories, um, especially stories that have not been represented in like mainstream media mm -hmm. over the last few decades. Um, and I think they're just like a really cool, flexible art form. Um, so if you have a local zine fest, go. Um, there might be someone selling science zines. And if not, all of the other topics of zines are super cool too. Yeah, great. 
Um, well, thank you so much for joining us tonight, Bradley. This was fascinating. Of course. Thanks and, for having me. Yeah. And um, yeah, next up we have Shahira Stargazer. Hi. Good morning from Malaysia. I'm Shahira. Um, so today I'll be uh, okay. Let me share my slide. Okay. There we go. So today I'll be uh, talking about the intersection of art, astronomy, and dark sky advocacy. And um, just now we have Jamie and Riley and scientists. And right now I'll be talking about a perspective of, a, of an educator and an artist. So a little bit about me. I'm a primary school educator. I'm a space artist of International Association of Storm Car Artists. I'm a dark sky advocate for Dark Sky Malaysia and International Dark Sky Association and strategic partner to Malaysian National Planetarium. So um, first of all, I would like to show all of you what have inspired me to create paintings that reflect on the wonders of the universe. And also um, I also create paintings to um, advocate to give um, awareness about light pollution and dark skies. So let's watch this video. This is a video by my uh, fellow friend, Sri Ram Rali. I hope all of you can hear it. Hey, Shahira, can you unmute because we can't hear the video when you... Great. All right, so that time looks just now always brings me to tears whenever I watch it because this is this feeling that I'm experiencing is the, uh, 
is inspired me keep you know keep on inspiring me to create um dark sky arts and astronomical arts because um i am not from science background but i have this deep passion and i believe that um astronomy and exploring the cosmos is for everyone and we used to think that um, art and science is a two branch of knowledge that sits the opposite ends of the spectrum. When art is expression of human skills and um, throughout history, we can see imprints of um, the ancient humans existence through their artworks. And these artworks hold knowledge, connection and emotional power. You know, astronomy and dark sky has guided humanity for thousands of years for them to earth, for them to do earthly affairs it became uh, the sky became the calendar, the clock, and the map to the ancient people. And at night, before the existence of light pollution, dark sky became the dominant presence. And when we are looking at night sky, what fascinates me is that it is the only thing that doesn't change as much through time, and it is it is connecting us with our ancestors. And where in it in both uh, field intersects, which is astronomy, art. And dark sky is uh, when humans they make physical representation of um, the knowledge that they have and the fascinations to the night sky and this knowledge is being um, passed to the future generations and humans also build architectural structures that traces movement of the sky and they created visual arts that reflect on the knowledge that they, uh, they have of our cosmos during that time and there are a lot of role of arts in astronomy. Uh, and I will explain it one by one. I hope we have enough time. And first of all is to visualize natural phenomenon. Because before the existence of camera, the only way was to know the celestial phenomenon that happened in the past is through the artworks created by the people in the past. And uh, for example, what we can see is uh, countless of cave paintings, um, pictographs, drawing sketches that are created um, to mark the occurrences of celestial phenomena that um, impacted the humans in community or individually. And some paintings indicate the technological advancements of how humans explore the cosmos during the time the artworks were created. And uh, this is these two are good examples of how humans visualize natural phenomena before the existence um, of camera. The first one is the painting of the comet discovered by Gottfried Kirch and dubbed as Comet Kirch. Uh, it is one of the brightest comets in um, 17th century and noted for its spectacular bright tail. And the people, if you can see here, the people depicted in this painting appear to uh, to be using Jacob's uh, staff or cross staff, which is an instrument uh, used in navigation to determine angles, which is useful for um, finding ship's latitude um, by measuring the altitude of Polaris, which is the North Star. And and the second one is a painting by Frederick Edwin Church, an American painter who painted this spectacular um, view of fireball meteor across the, um, across the evening sky. And it is extremely a rare earth grazing meteor procession. And uh, with this painting, I also included this um, poem, nor the strange huge meteor procession dazzling and clear shooting over our heads. Even though these people they um, haven't uh, didn't meet, but there's correlation between this uh, painting and also the poem. And there are a lot of a lot more paintings, which uh, indicates um, this uh, com the Great Comet of 1680, the Comet Kirch. It has been uh, made by different people, which also depicted the same thing. And art is also used to record detailed observation of a celestial phenomenon because astronomers back then they worked with artists or they became an artist themselves to record these observations whether through telescope or in naked eyes um, using artistic techniques and back then uh, the mastery of artistic skills uh, were important to astronomy as it is an intensely visual subject 
it is equivalent as um, how astronomers, it is important for astronomers to be skillful in using optical instruments, such as telescopes and cameras to capture the images and occurrences in the sky. So um, for examples, uh, here we have Sidereus Nincius by Galileo Galilei, where he, uh, when he provided a lively an accessible account of his telescopic observation of the moon and his discovery uh, of uh, the four satellites of um, of Jupiter. And this one is uh, actually sketches from Leonardo da Vinci. He sketched um, the Earth shine, um, which uh, uh, it is um, entitled of the moon. No solid body lighter than air. It is one of the section in Codex Leicester. And yeah, uh, even though that time people haven't thought about um, Earthshine yet, or 500 years, they haven't figured out the mystery of Earthshine. However, Leonardo da Vinci has already um, created these sketches to show his understanding of how Earthshine uh, occurred. And then Art is also used in astronomy to map the sky and surface of celestial bodies. And uh, so celestial astro uh, uh, cartography, uranography, star cartography is one of the area of astronomy that produces star maps. And back then, um, early star maps were very artistic in nature and truly took not only scientific mind, but also the skills of an amazing artist. And we have a lot of uh, celestial cartographers. Um, uh, you can check out their amazing works um, online because I cannot exactly show uh, right now. And we, besides visual arts, um, astronomers can also um, write poems. For example, uh, poems, poems uh, by Artis of Soli in his um, uh, work entitled Phenomena, where he talks about the constellations and the stories behind those constellations. And art is also used to simulate our place in the universe because based on the observations of celestial bodies that move across the sky, humans make countless attempts to visualize the universe that we're living in. And so astronomers and artists come up with arts that shows an overview perspective of how the cosmos we're living in. And they're putting uh, the viewer in the perspective where they are outside of the celestial sphere through the uh, meticulous observation inside the sphere. So simply said, it, it is a three-dimensional projection based on the two-dimensional observation. And lastly, art is also um, used in astronomy to illustrate foreign environments in the outer space and um, most of this um, uh, what we call this one is what we call descriptive realism space art is pioneered by Chesley Bonestell and lastly what I like to do is um, creating arts to appreciate and expressing passion towards night sky and I'm pretty sure everyone knows this um, artist who made Starry Night and he also made this um, uh, Starry Night over the road um, Van Gogh also created this art which is also um, star and astronomical theme um, so there are lots of forms of art and the one that I'm um, using is uh, visual art, literature art and um, filming. I'm dwelling in these field of arts to create arts that reflects on um, dark sky and also astronomy. And yeah, space art and astronomy, uh, there are difference between both, but usually I would, um, the one that I'm always uh, uh, create um, the Kind of art that I always create is astronomical art. It is the subset of space art, and it is uh, it owes its inspiration to the growing heritage of scientific knowledge and imagery of the physical universe. So usually, astronomical artists would uh, paint solar system, planets and moons, stars, galaxies, and events from across vast stretches of time. And a lot of style terms for space arts um, that artists can explore, um, such as descriptive realism like um, Chesley Bonesdale art. Cosmic expressionism is the uh, type of art that I'm uh, creating. And 
a lot more, but you can go to IEEE website to discover more about the style terms of space arts. So this one, um, cosmic expressionism is akin to what's done in post-impressionist era, where usually uh, the artist will use color, shape, and form to give viewer uh, the artist's impression of the subject, the astronomical subject. So it's not um, realistic, it's not um, exactly like what we see in the picture, but it is more uh, of how the artist, um, uh, the artist see the objects. Um, for example, uh, for me, I'm using um, these lines and to create some sort of movements um, of the uh, celestial, of the astronomical objects. And also I would um, in, in put my emotions in making those arts. So whenever I show the painting, I will also express my emotions, how I felt, how I felt in creating these arts. So my work in um, uh, connecting bridging uh, arts and astronomy and dark sky, one of it is um, creating this, uh, working together with Sriram Rali, the person who, uh, uh, who I showed the video just now. Uh, right now, we are currently working on a film documentary entitled In Search of the Stars, where we depicted how true darkness feels like through art and also film. And I also uh, work together with International Dark Sky Association and Dark Sky Malaysia to create dark sky awareness and uh, to create dark sky awareness arts and sharing them in social medias and involving myself in um, events and celebrations such as International Dark Sky Week and Dark Sky Conference. And lastly, um, for astronomy outreach, I work together with the National Planetarium and Astronomical Associations. I create uh, astronomical arts and involve myself in space events and celebrations, which shows that artists can also involve themselves in um, science field. Uh, and this, um, and scientists also can involve themselves in art to bridge this both field so that it will be more accessible to the public. I also write poems. Um, I wrote a lot of poems, which is uh, usually uh, involve um, astronomy, astrophysics, and cosmology. Even though I didn't have the opportunity to study cosmology, astrophysics, but I loved uh, the field so much. So I want to express the emotions I felt whenever I read uh, the books and watching documentaries by creating poems. And I also have virtual galleries. So if you want to visit, I uh, want to look um, uh, at my arts, you want to discover more of my work, you can go to the um, these um, links I will provide later to uh, Arya or Christina so you can um, see the artworks that I'm working on, which uh, involves astronomy and dark sky advocacy. Okay, so that's all. Thank you. Hello. Hi. This was amazing. Um, I'm here now for Q&A. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we have some comments in, in our chat coming in saying that like, this is amazing. Like, we're learning so much about astro art as a field and, you know, the history of it. This is, yeah, such a cool field of art um, to learn about. So thank you for walking us through it. Uh, this is great. And, thank you, um, Yeah. I'm sorry and, it took a long time, did it? No, no, this was this was like perfect. Um, and I do have a few questions for you. So can you first uh, tell us a little bit more about what makes Dark Sky so important? Um, you mentioned a little bit about it in your talk, but tell, could you tell us a little more? Oh, Dark Sky. So back then we don't have the light pollution. So um, humans and ecosystems are living together and they're, they're coexist. But nowadays it is when uh, we are exposed to light pollution. It gives um, this detrimental effect towards humans, um, the animals and plants. For example, at night, uh, some of the nocturnal, nocturnal animals, they cannot go out because too much light flooded the, uh, their, their habitat. So they cannot be and they cannot hide in the darkness because there's too much, too much light. So they are exposed to the uh, danger of the other predators. And for example, fireflies, they, uh, they use their dim lights 
to attract mates. But when there are too much light, uh, lights, artificial lights around them, so they can uh, their partners they are, cannot see their their cues. So that causes uh, fireflies to decline. The population of uh, fireflies to decline over time. And for humans, uh, we need the darkness because um, we have this, uh, what we call circadian rhythm. So the circadian mm -hmm. rhythm relies uh, on the rhythm of uh, light and dark. So when at night we don't get the dark, uh, it, it is taken away by uh, this artificial light. It would be detrimental for us. For example, some of us would experience insomnia, anxieties, and so much more uh, health issues. Mm -hmm. yeah and and i remember you mentioning the cultural connection too like it just feels yes. like this uh, so, much, so much so much yeah i have so much things to share on dark sky but i also want to share about art yes <laughs> so yes and on that we need topic, like one hour for that more than one yeah. hour <laughs> seriously yeah no it's it's <laughs> so much and and um yeah but but to speak of your art um what are your go-to favorite materials when you're making visual art i'm just curious um what do you love to make most i love to use watercolor because watercolor. i've been working with watercolor for years so usually i would uh, work with watercolor but um, i realized that sometimes when i want to make this nebulous effect of a galaxy or a nebulas using watercolor would be pretty hard uh, pretty complicated so I would switch um, to acrylic arts but I also uh, work with digital uh, digital arts um, uh, but not really much on digital but so my favorite go-to um, art medium is usually watercolor yeah that's awesome that's awesome and um, so so when you're creating art you meant you gave us this really great overview of you know like documenting what's in space versus expression and passion and and those things wh where do you like to stay in that kind of spectrum and how does that come into play together for you usually i would stay in a spectrum where i i feel personally connected with the cosmos like for example there's this one time i watch uh the um Leonard comet this one is my favorite story because i was uh, I, I went to the local observatory and i watched a comet for the first time, uh, the landed comet is in front of me on the on the computer screen. But we're, we're observing it through the telescope, and it's linked to the computer screen. And the emotions I felt that time is truly overwhelming. I can express it through words. So I'm thinking, like, how can I? How can I? How can I express this uh, through my artworks, uh, through through my own way? Because I'm not a scientist. Because I'm a scientist. Uh, because I'm not a scientist, so sorry. <laughs> because no, I'm not no, a scientist. No, no so uh, I decided to just, you know what, I'm going to paint this feelings. So I create yeah. this. Um, you can, uh, if any one of you are curious what kind of painting I'm working on, you can go to the uh, IAAA um, Women in Space Art Virtual Gallery. So that's a painting I'm talking about. So I'm creating this painting that. Uh, imitate Van Gogh uh, art style and I make this uh, the comment looks like it's something is revolving around the sky is revolving around it because I feel like during that time my whole world is revolving about, around that comet so I, oh, I, love, I love to that. explore that and at this spectrum I would love to stay where I feel uh, the closest to the cosmos yeah I really really love that and it, it sounds like you get your inspiration from so many different sources like um you know, like you were saying the 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 video feed and just being outdoors i'm guessing um <laughs> do you have any other sources of inspiration as well i love to travel so <laughs> yeah whenever i travel i i feel like this i'm having this overview um perspective of our world so i would like to express that in in my painting sometimes i feel like my painting is so busy but that's how I work. This I want to make it busy. I want to make it look like I have everything in there because when when we when we like move out, we we move out a bit out of our circle everyday uh, day to day life. This world is so huge, and we we have so much to discover. So this one painting needs to have everything in it. 
<laughs> yeah, well, you just got to keep creating more. Like, we're waiting to see them. <laughs> and um, for anybody out there, please go check out Shahira's amazing work. Um, her website and the virtual gallery that she mentioned are, are both linked in our chats. So definitely go check it out. Follow her social media. Um, but thank yeah, you so, so much. Shahira Stargazer. I forgot. Shahira Stargazer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, thank you so much for, for sharing with us today. It was so lovely to have you um, and hear from you. So, yeah. <laughs> thank you so much, um, Arya, Christina, and California Academy of Science for inviting me. It was a thank pleasure. You. Absolutely. And I'm going to bring Christina back up um, for our final, final farewell. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Um, so yeah, just another huge thanks again to um, Shahira Stargazer, to Jamie Green, to Riley Lewis, um, and uh, we, yeah, we loved we loved having everybody here. Isn't it wonderful to hear about how many different ways people talk about science and and the way? Yeah, I don't know. I love I loved it. Yeah, I feel like we covered a good chunk of the universe. <laughs> yeah, good. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, um, anyway, yeah, thank you all for joining us. Uh, Night School is here uh, the first and third Thursdays of each month. Tell your friends. Um, coming up in a couple weeks on May 19th, we have a program called Into the Mangroves. But basically, <laughs> if you don't know how interesting mangrove forests are, they're very, spoiler alert, they're very interesting <laughs> from their roots underneath the water to the, to the, life they support in their branches plus um i don't know they're great so so tune in and yeah yeah they've got so much going on literally you think a tree can't do it all a tree can't do it all <laughs> but subscribe to, so you'll be notified subscribe to our youtube channel um so you'll be notified when that when that comes out um and all of these recordings stay on our youtube channel as well so you can um you know watch them again and again should you like share them with your friends we won't we won't mind um, but yeah thanks so much for tuning in tonight good night everybody <laughs>